Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to our event. Um, Global Integrity is hosting this today, and we are a learning-centered organization that works with partners across the globe to address complex challenges such as anti-corruption, service delivery, and open governance. Um, one of our flagship programs is the Global Integrity Anti-Corruption Evidence Program, called JAYS for short, and we have supported 19 research projects around the world that have generated actionable evidence that policymakers, uh, practitioners, and advocates have used to design um, and implement more effective anti-corruption initiatives. And it's also part of a wider ACE program that is interdisciplinary, and its approach is designed to produce new and operationally relevant research. Um, and by extension, it um, produces more effective anti-corruption initiatives for policymakers. Um, my name is Isabella Akhmirevska, I'm a program manager with GI, and um, just for heads up, we will soon enter the next phase, and so stay tuned for the EOI call. Um, this report has been produced by the Freedom of Eurasia, which is a politically and religiously independent non-governmental human rights organization that was established for the purpose of informing the international community on fundamental human, civil, and political rights. Um, today, we are here with one of um, the researchers behind this report, um, Thomas Main, who's also one of our star GIA's researchers. Um, he is the research fellow at the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford and the former visiting fellow at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chatham House. Um, the discussants today will be Leila Nazgul Saidbek who is an exiled lawyer, anti-corruption and human rights advocate from the Kyrgyz Republic, who was granted asylum in Austria. So that's where she's based now. And she's also the chairwoman of Freedom for Eurasia. Um, next up is Christian Leslet. He is the head of the School of Applied Social and Policy Sciences at the University of Ulster. And he also sits on the executive board of the International State Crime Initiative. Um, and uh, the last discussant is Lucas Olof uh, Fernandez. He's a lawyer by training and currently serves on the board of directors at the Commission for Equatorial Guinea. Um, and he's also the regional coordinator for Central African countries um, uh, and program coordinator for Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean for Transparency International. So with that, I will hand it to Tom to tell us more about the report and the reason why we're here. Thank you. Well, thanks, Isabella, and many thanks to Global Integrity for uh, arranging this uh, uh, event, and, and thanks to you all for uh, being here. Um, so um, we've re released this uh, uh, report uh, based on over a year's worth of, uh, of, of work, focusing on Gulnada Karimova, who I'm sure most of us know, uh, according to the US Department of Justice, uh, received over received around a billion dollars in, in in bribes related to the telecoms deal deals um, struck in Uzbekistan. Um, and basically, I, I started this uh, research. We started this research as a, as a kind of an internet intellectual exercise. We uh, know that Kadima have put a lot of 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 the ill-gotten gains into property, all these lists being uh, banded around the internet. So why don't we go in and, and, and have a look at what we can find out about these properties and what's happened to these properties uh, since they were bought around a decade uh, ago. Uh, we weren't necessarily thinking we were going to find anything new, but actually we, we, we did find lots of new information, uh, including we now have a, a rough figure for how much she put into property, 240 uh, million pounds. And I think that is probably on the, on the conservative uh, uh, side, doesn't include properties that we don't have any information uh, about, such as six properties uh, supposedly frozen in uh, in Russia. Um, we also learned quite curious things, uh, such as when she was in jail in 2016, she managed to sell one property in, in Hong Kong and in 2019 tell, uh, sell two properties in, in Russia to uh, the wife of an associate of, 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 of Putin. Uh, so clearly she was getting help from the, uh, at the outside. Uh, in regard to the UK, which is where I'm, I'm based, and uh, a, a lot of this report is about the UK, Karimova had 
uh, five properties and she was using uh, British Virgin Island companies to hide her own ownership and also a proxy in the firm in the form of her boyfriend and uh, former husband Rustam Madumarov. Now two of these flats were sold in 2013 uh, for just over 14 million pounds. Now that money's gone, it can't be uh, recovered. And a little bit later in, in my comments, uh, we'll get into how, how that, that, that happened and, and why that transaction wasn't, wasn't stopped. But I think if we're just taking a step back uh, for a minute, uh, what does this report show? I think this report is yet more evidence that the UK is the worst in the, in the Western world at tackling kleptocratic wealth, certainly in proportion to the amount of uh, kleptocratic wealth uh, that is here. Um, some examples from the report, France, uh, where Karim had uh, three properties, they raided those properties in 2013, and by 2014, they were, were frozen. And now at least four of Karimova's UK properties were known or could be ascertained in 2014. Even Tatler magazine was reporting about Karimova having properties in Mayf Mayfair in 2014. So why did it take the UK until 2017, seemingly, to do anything about this when this serious fraud office froze the remaining three properties. And six years later, uh, the money from those properties is, is, is still uh, to be recovered. That case is still ongoing. And what is uh, disappointing is how little information um, the UK authorities have released about this investigation. Until I pointed it out to them, the serious fraud office had, had literally five of text about this case on their website and um, what we hope the report to do will be to help disseminate information about this case. We have, um, uh, for example, put the uh, civil recovery claim, the skeleton argument from the serious fraud office uh, on top of the, uh, on, our, on the Freedom for Eurasia website so everyone can see uh, the, the, at least the serious fraud office's uh, uh, case here. Another example of where things don't seem to have been investigated, you can go online, you can go to Company's House, you can download the accounts for a company called Pan Alley uh, Limited. Uh, in these accounts, it is said that Pan Alley's parent company is a company called Takilant Limited. Now, if you've been following the cream of the story, uh, Takilant Limited is the Gibraltar-based company that, according to the US authorities, received these literally hundreds of millions of dollars in, in bribes. So if I'm a, a you know an investigator uh, on behalf of the um, uh, 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 the UK purchase, um, we um, I didn't catch that. Sorry, I've got. Could you try again? I uh, uh, computer's doing funny funny things. Uh, let me just off. Um, so if I was an investigator um, uh, looking at possible flows into the UK, a good place to start would surely be uh, Pan Alley Limited, a UK company that has a link to this Takilant Limited. Um, but has any uh, uh, UK authority, law enforcement authority, looked at uh, Pan Alley Limited? We don't know, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem so. Um, and when I asked the serious fraud office about it, they said that there was no link between Pan Alley Limited and the properties that they have frozen. But of course, what the cream of a case tells us is that it's a much wider case than just these properties. Uh, it involves lots of different companies, lots of different financial flows. Um, so yes, let's move a little bit on to the enablers of, 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 of these deals, concentrating on, on the UK. What did we find out? Well, um, two flats uh, were sold, as I say, in 2013. At this point, Karimova had not been arrested yet, um, but there had been reports published by the BBC, by the OCCRP, linking Karimova not only to the bribery scandal, but also identifying Madumarov as her, um, as her boyfriend. So this should really be a big red flag for any professional who is involved with Madumarov, and in my opinion, a suspicious activity uh, report should have been uh, filed. Now, this is where we get into the difficulties of uh, looking at the uh, enablers uh, because we're not privy to the due diligence um, they, they did or didn't do. And of course, if they did file a suspicious activity report, they, are, they have fulfilled their responsibilities under the UK's anti-money laundering legislation. Uh, the question then becomes, if they did file a suspicious activity report, is why didn't the National Crime Agency come in and, and, and stop these property transaction 
based on the fact that she was being linked at the time to this multinational bribery scandal. Now, uh, the law firm that represented the BVI companies that owned several of the properties in London was a law firm called uh, Quastles. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully they're, they're, they're watching uh, um, uh, today. Now, um, you know, being a responsible uh, researcher and academic, I wrote to Quastles, giving them an opportunity uh, to, to comment. We're not alleging wrongdoing, but as I've pointed out, there are certainly questions in the public interest to answer here. Now, Quastles didn't answer the questions, and that's, that's fine. There's no obligation, of course, to answer questions. But what they shouldn't do, and what they shouldn't be allowed to do, is perhaps is issue perhaps the, the most egregious uh, libel threat that I've seen in my 17 years of, of, of doing this. Uh, we uh, we uh, publish it basically in, 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 in full in, in, in the report, but just to give you a flavor, they told Freedom Free Asia that any article which mentions them, which seeks by illustration to draw attention to a controversial area will result in litigation, even if coverage may not mean to criticize or stigmatize this firm. So basically what, what they're saying is that even though it's, public record that they have been involved with these BVI companies, um, that we cannot mention them whatsoever. This is um, not acceptable. And this is what we call a, a, a strategic lawsuit against public participation, a, a slap. And what is rather disturbing is usually slaps get issued by on behalf of the oligarchs, on behalf of the bad guys. But this was actually a law firm uh, acting uh, you know, on its own beh behalf to try and stifle public interest uh, uh, reporting about, uh, uh, about uh, its involvement in, 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 this, in this case. Uh, and finally, uh, moving on to, to something uh, I think which is perhaps uh, of even more concern, uh, an accountancy firm called SH Landes, uh, mentioned in the BBC uh, article uh, that uh, hit yesterday. Um, SH Landis signed off on, or they, they, they were responsible for the accounts for that company, Panali Limited, and those were issued in September 2013. So this is about almost a year after reports had started coming out about Karimova's involvement in this uh, bribery case, identifying Madhu Malav and other of uh, her associates as, as, as being uh, close to her. But not only that, SH Landis also helped um, Madhu Marov tried to acquire an offshore company uh, in order that Madhu Marov, and hence Karimova, could buy a $40 million uh, private uh, jet. And if you look at the emails that we've been uh, privy to, uh, there are many red flags that should have alerted SH Landis to uh, suspicious activity. Um, one, one, of, uh, uh, one red flag, for example, uh, was that Madhu Marov was claiming in his as his source of wealth uh, this company Uzdan Robita, a uh, an Uzbek telecoms company. Uh, anybody who knows anything about Karimova uh, Karim knows her links to this company, and 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 literally five minutes of googling on Uzdan Robita would have revealed to S H Landis or anybody doing due diligence that there was a potential link between Madhu Marov and uh, Karimova. So there are many questions to, 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 to answer for SH Landis. Again, have the UK authorities uh, you know, investigated this, uh, looked into it at all? Uh, we don't know for sure, but my suspicion is that they haven't. And this is even though the UK authorities have said that clamping down on, on enablers of, 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 of corruption is, is one of their priorities uh, uh, going forward. So I think I'm going to leave it uh, there. Uh, lots to, to talk about. Um, maybe later in the q and I'd just like to talk a little bit about this new register of uh, overseas entities that is supposedly going to clean up the uh, UK property market. But I think I'll leave that for, for the Q&A and uh, pass on to our next speaker, which um, I think is Chris, right? Yep, I can. I'm I'm happy to jump in now if if that's okay with the other discussants. Um, yeah, I mean, thank you, um, Tom, um, for inviting me and um, to to share in this really important research that you've done. Um, and um, as part of of my role today, I want to do two things. Um, was firstly, at, at Tom's request, I was going to give him a bit of an update on what's happening in Switzerland, which I think complements his own work in the UK. Um, so I'll do that first, and then I'll just provide a few um, quick um, notes in response to a question that I'd like to kind of put out there, which is, is the Karamova case an example of an anti-corruption success 
or an anti-corruption failure? And, and I'll try and give a kind of quick, pithy, provocative answer to that question, which may be slightly rhetorical as well. Um, so in terms of um, what's happening in Switzerland, uh, in comparison to the, to the UK, we've seen a much more proactive response from the Swiss authorities um, who have um, attempted to prosecute those in the Karamova group who've been involved in money laundering through its um, jurisdiction. And also they've attempted to seize um, a significant volume of the um, uh, proceeds of the bribes that were provided by three telecommunication companies to Karamova through those offshore conduits, one of which was meant, mentioned before uh, by Tom Tackelant Limited. Um, what's really surprising in the, in the Swiss um, situation is that um, it looks like um, the lion's share of the money that's currently in Switzerland, $293 million US, is set to be returned, not to the people of Uzbekistan, but to Tackle Out Limited. Um, and, oops. Next slide, please. Great, thanks for that. Um, so uh, just to repeat that point, the 293 million is being set to be returned to Takalant Limited, um, which uh, is owned by Karamova. And why may you ask? Because Karamova's council appealed the original lower court decision to seize the assets and argued that Ms. Karamova is not a public official, has no authority over the telecommunication sector, and therefore under Swiss law cannot be conceived as a bribable official. And the, that through the, um, the, the mantle over to the prosecutors to prove that uh, in fact, in uh, uh, um, uh, Uzbekistan's kleptocratic system, one doesn't need to be the minister for telecommunications to wield political authority over it. There's actually a shadow system in place that empowers people like Karamova who come from very powerful dynasties um, to exert political authority over a wide range of areas. Um, unfortunately, the Swiss prosecutor was left flat-footed and was unable to prove that to the satisfaction of the court. And, and for that reason, the court said that they do not believe that there is currently probative evidence before them to suggest that Ms. Karamova had that authority and that the, um, and that, that the, the decision is to be returned to the lower court with the a very likely scenario that the lower court will follow that, that appeals um, guidance and will hand back the money to tackle that limited. Um, so that's a really worrying occurrence. And I think it chimes really nicely also with Tom's previous research on Kazakhstan and um, unexplained wealth orders, where we're seeing the National Crime Agency, the prosecutors in Switzerland, being left flat footed because they don't have a comprehensive understanding of the shadow systems that operate in kleptocracies. And therefore they're not able to situate the wealth and the actions of the targeted kleptocrat. And I think that's a real gap in expertise and a real gap in knowledge that needs to be remedied. And that's not to cast aspersions at either of those authorities. You know, we can only learn through trial and error, but unless we learn and we, we actually remedy these defects, we'll continue to see that um, these kleptocrats will be able to take advantage of these um, of, of secrecy vehicles to get away with what they're doing. And so the last point I just make here, um, and I'll try and do this quickly, um, is, is just in regards to, um, I think that follows on nicely, is Karamova, the Karamova case, an example of anti-corruption success or anti-corruption failure? Um, well, I think in terms of, um, you could point to the, in terms of success, Ms. Karamova is currently imprisoned in Uzbekistan. She's had sanctions placed against her under global Magnitsky legislation. And also the three bribe givers have all um, signed deferred prosecution agreements and paid substantial fines. Uh, and in addition, there has been a tranche of, uh, of about $130 million in um, Switzerland that have been seized in return. So that's on the plus column. On the, on the other side of the, of the balance sheet, if you will, um, is a couple of facts that I'd just like to put out there. Or, or should I say what, what seem to me be facts? I'd be, I'd be interested if anyone would contest these who may have um, better knowledge. Um, so the first thing I'd say is, firstly, why did the Karamova 
um, case come to our attention? Was it because anti-money laundering systems picked up on all these dodgy um, transactions and, and, and alerted the relevant authorities and they swooped on Karamova? No, um, the, the, the timeline sequence appears to be that there was an internal conflict within her own business organization that led to one of the main operatives fleeing to Russia. And then lo and behold, um, information was leaked to the Swedish press who exposed it. And then suddenly we saw um, um, the, the um, authorities in a number of jurisdictions swoop and do their thing. So it wasn't a case of an anti-money laundering systems seemingly detecting this case and bringing it to the, uh, the attention of authorities. It was actually um, the uh, journalists who, who were the ones who first brought this to light. Secondly, yes, Karimova has been imprisoned in um, Uzbekistan, but not for bribery or it's for organized crime. And the authorities there have been very firm in challenging any idea that she had the kind of political authority that's been attributed to her because obviously <laughs> there are people who have vested interests in saying that Uzbekistan does not allow um, dynasties to, uh, to assume control of the authoritarian apparatus. Third, um, we've seen prosecutions of Telly Sanira, uh, uh, executives fall over in Sweden on the grounds that I just pointed to, that the, that the prosecutor couldn't prove that Ms. Karimova was a bribable official, that she had authority in the area of telecommunications. We've seen the Uzbek authorities being very unhelpful in, in mutual legal assistance requests and refusing to provide key information to their counterparts overseas. We've seen jurisdictions like UK and they're also at Gibraltar who, despite being the epicenter of where these, um, uh, these bribery offences were organised, have done um, very little. And, and as Tom knows, when, when we approached Gibraltar, they were quite incredulous that we would come to them and ask why they aren't doing more, um, despite the fact that the two main corporate vehicles in this case would, were, were based there. Um, we've seen, as Tom points out eloquently there, many of the enablers appear to have escaped um, any kind of scrutiny from the relevant authorities. Um, we've seen, um, uh, yes, we've seen assets, some assets frozen and some assets seized regard to telecommunications. But in the case of the Karamova Group, there's also big questions asked over oil and gas and, uh, and certain companies connected to that. And there may be uh, many more hundreds of millions, if not billions of money that could have been seized that wasn't because these concerns with regard to her role in the oil and gas sector were not sufficiently probed. Um, and we've seen, yes, uh, Tom pointed that we've seen some assets return from France and we've seen some from Russia and also from the Netherlands, but it's been done without transparency in a very opaque manner. Um, and I'll cut it short here by saying, I could go on, I have a longer list, believe it or not, I could go on for a fair bit, but I'll say one last thing. And that is that um, the, 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 um, the, 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 the significant fines that have been paid uh, uh, will, will, to my understanding, not go to the victims in Uzbekistan, but will go to the respective treasuries. I think it's shared between the, the Dutch government and the US government. So at the end of all this, at the end of all this, this international work, we're gonna see uh, a bit over a hundred million dollars that will be returned to victims in Uzbekistan. And we might frighteningly see the rest of this fortune, that not only from telecommunications from the other sectors, go into the hands of, back into the hands of Karamova, or we're also seeing that people connected to her are also acquiring some of these assets on the cheap as well. Uh, and that's a really worrying outcome. So I'll finish there. I think it's Leila to pass on to you now. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to, um, to, to talk about uh, briefly about the asset um, return process. Uh, once the assets are identified and are um, traced back to the kleptocrat, and um, there are facts pointing to these assets being the proceeds of corruption, they must be frozen and seized to eventually be returned to the nation. Um, where they have been stolen. Um, the assets return in itself is a very complex pro process with um, lots of legal difficulties. But besides that, as, um, as the previous speakers have mentioned, it's very difficult to verify the information, um, especially in countries like Uzbekistan and also Russia. We have encountered some difficulties with Tom trying to verify the information provided by the Uzbek authorities about Gunara's uh, properties and some money that she held on Russian accounts. 
uh, we have we have not been able to to locate any court records to to give us any details about it. Also about the courier's information about um, the plan to split the proceeds between Uzbekistan and Russia that is also not clear how they were planning to carry that out. So as a result of so many um, uh, complexities, uh, the asset return is something that doesn't unfortunately happen very often. And um, uh, the Europol asset recovery unit data uh, provides um, a figure of only 2% um, of assets that are ever seized or frozen and only 1% that is being confiscated at the EU level. That's a minuscule amount. Um, the real life ex examples uh, show even greater disparity where billions, tens of billions of dollars are being stolen with only a fraction being returned. Um, and even this money is being returned often without the necessary checks in place that would ensure that the money uh, that is being returned is, is uh, used in a responsible manner, is not restolen again, which um, sometimes does unfortunately happen. Um, as Chris has mentioned, the French asset return is, um, is, some, is an example of how restitution should not be made because it was carried out behind closed doors. It was uh, carried out without the participation of civil society. Um, the, the NGOs, the French NGOs were left completely out of the process. Um, and uh, it was also uh, carried out without the mechanisms uh, set up inside Uzbekistan to ensure um, the proper use of the funds. Um, and that was all happening against the background of the reports that were coming out about the, the, a big chunk of Gulnara's property in Uzbekistan uh, ending up in the hands of Mirziyev, the current president of Uzbekistan, in, in, his, um, in his relatives' uh, hands, uh, namely his son-in-law was mentioned. Um, and the thing is, we, we, it's not like we don't have an example to follow. We do have examples to follow that have been successful, one of them being um, a 2008 uh, asset return to Kazakhstan that was um, done through a structure called Buddha Foundation that was set up by the US, Swiss and Kazakh government uh, with the support of World Bank. Uh, it was a successful asset return. However, uh, several years, $115 million actually of bribery money uh, uh, paid to Nazarbayev was returned. It was, it, was, it was a very successful process. But years later, another return was, was, was done to Kazakhstan where no such structure was used. And obviously um, what happened was that that next payment um, disappeared within the structures um, that were created by Dariga Nazarbayeva. Um, we have to remember that all of the countries of Central Asia are autocratic and ultra corrupt nations. So returning any assets without strict oversight equals to knowingly letting these assets to be restolen. Um, it is quite clear to us, um, to, to a lot of people, that the West is completely contaminated with kleptocratic money. And so as we are scrambling for the answer to the question of what to do to stop that flow of um, uh, dirty money and what to do about the sums, the enormous sums already floating around, uh, we cannot approach this issue without addressing the issue of the army of service providers, the lawyers, the accountants, real estate agents, PR agents, um, who are instrumental in, um, in making all of those kleptocratic schemes possible. Because without their help, none of the uh, kleptocrats would have been able to do what they have done. Um, and the list of the clients of these service providers is long, and it contains the names of princes and princesses that are similar to Gulnara, um, who are also probably known to a lot of you. Um, and um, they, they, many of them are still even not even looked into. And um, I just want to name a few. Um, the, the name of Nazarbayev's clan uh, members, the Kazakh trio that, uh, that is, is not really Kazakh, is a trio of um, Central Asian oligarchs. Um, that Tom Burgess and some other authors wrote about um, and who attacked him with a lawsuit. Um, there is a number of Kazakh and Uzbek oligarchs that are worth looking into. There is Maxim Bakiyev that Tom and Global Witness done research on, uh, who lives in Surrey mansion um, and continues running his operations out of UK. Um, he, he hasn't been investigated. There is also Abdul Qadir, a secretive Uyghur oligarch who is standing in the center of smuggling scheme that originates um, out of Central Asia, but stretches across the world. He owns 
um, luxury properties across UK, EU, the United States. Um, and he participates in all of the largest projects launched by Uzbek and Kyrgyz authorities through his firms that are based in Germany and the UK. And Chris has done some um, amazing work on researching that person as well. That, and the list just goes on and we can talk for hours just listing those people. Um, so which means there is much work still needs to be done to motivate um, the law enforcement uh, of democratic countries to launch investigations into persons who, um, who are known uh, from the, the investigations, from journalist investigations, from researchers, um, because taking action against kleptocrats and their enablers um, and against their stolen assets is not only important for the countries of Central Asia, who are of course who of course suffer from, uh, from the human rights abuses, which is um, a result of a cryptocracy, but it's also very important for the democratic countries because leaving the issue of export of corruption without a solution um, poisons the societies, it erodes uh, democratic institutions, it um, fosters a laser fair attitude towards dirty money, and corrupt uh, criminal behaviors, um, and um, it threatens the freedom of speech. All of those things, it tries to destroy all of the things that uh, separate the democratic societies from um, those authoritarian regimes. Thank you. With that, um, I will pass the floor on to the, moder the moderator. Thank you. Tom, um, I think there's only one speaker left in the queue, which is Lucas Ola. Go ahead. Thank you. I, you are right. Thank you very much for, for inviting me to, for this session. Just just for for uh, on the way of uh, presenting a bit myself, I work mostly on Equatorial Guinea and Central African countries. Uh, I am a board member of the Commission of Juries of Equatorial Guinea, and uh, as um, it was uh, mentioned, one of the uh, key elements that uh, that I could see from reading uh, these reports is uh, the amount of similarities that uh, we can see or we can um, find also in countries uh, in, in Central Africa region. Uh, it is amazing how uh, the examples of human rights abuses, the examples of uh, uh, rulers that are still getting more and more power uh, while uh, being prosecuted abroad, but getting more and more power in, in, inside the countries is exactly what's also happening in Central, in Central Africa region with the added uh, element that there is actually no even um, expectation of a, of a local prosecution. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, with uh, with this being said, uh, my my uh, reaction uh, to, uh, to the to the report was uh, precisely that that why are, are we really and I maybe this is uh, also in line with what uh, Christian said earlier ab about are we. Uh, maybe helping at some point uh, these dynasties or these uh, because in, in Central Africa definitely are, there are different dynasties ruling uh, Gabon, ruling Cameroon, ruling Equatorial Guinea, Congo. These are families that are uh, all the, the same rulers that are in power, but their families are still uh, in line actually for succession in, in, in mostly all of all of them. So uh, the fact that uh, prosecution abroad, the Equatorial Guinea's vice president, the son of, of the current president, has been prosecuted in France, in the US, in South Africa, and Switzerland. But at the same time, he's becoming, uh, uh, he was appointed uh, vice president. At some point, he's now given even more powers um, uh, to rule the country. The same goes to with. Um, uh, Congo Brazzaville or, or, or Cameroon. So one that's that's my reflection on is it what are we not uh, uh, getting? What is what what is not happening? 
And from my point of view, and, and, and it's just my, my, my point of view, is that uh, we maybe are not uh, uh, doing much in um, uh, implementing even existing laws. So that's the, the first thing. I think there are laws that are, are there, I do, and, but they're not fully implemented globally, I'm, I'm talking here. Uh, just to, just as an example, I worked for a, for, a, for a company that used to do uh, politically exposed persons profiles, which was then used by the banks to then report any suspicious activity to the authorities. That, but so we did a lot of those. We actually had almost every minister in all over the world registered there uh, or, and their um, close associates. But law enforcement authorities would not do too much or that much uh, uh, in prosecuting them, despite the, that they, they, they did not. So my, my take is that, is it, is it true sometimes that, they, that, that banks would say they don't have information? No, I don't think so. Or, or, or intermediaries, they do have information. That's definitely the case. Now, do they report it to the authorities? Maybe some would not do, do it uh, as diligently as they should, but they are doing it. So uh, are the, the uh, prosecuting or the, the enforcement authorities not doing their job? Therefore, what should we do? And sometimes it's a political decision. Should we prosecute certain uh, oligarch or, or, or not? And if we don't, uh, then business continues as usual. But then we have some certain consequences. That's, that's why I keep talking about feeding the beast. And we saw it with, uh, with, with uh, Russia. All those soldiers that were coming, people were telling uh, that this is corrupt money coming in, et cetera, et cetera. But now the reaction was just a year ago or so that uh, sanctions were starting to be, be implemented when they realized that, okay, we, we, the beast is now against us. And I think uh, this goes for, 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 uh, um, for the case of uh, Uzbekistan. And it is also the case that is, in my view, it's also um, going to happen in, in Central Africa. The, the, we should also put this in, into context. Uh, there is corruption in, 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 in Equatorial Guinea, in Gabon, in Congo, in Angola, etc. But that corruption has a direct link to human rights abuses. Uh, people are being jailed, uh, people are being beaten, people are running out of, uh, of, of, uh, of those countries and appearing in, in other countries as, as, as uh, immigrants and then being, I don't know, uh, treated as, as, um, uh, as non-human beings. Um, Therefore, it is part of uh, our obligation to make sure that we should not allow that to happen. If I'm sitting, uh, I'm based, uh, I'm based in, in, in Portugal, if I'm sitting here, I don't really understand that, I understand that the fact that uh, human rights abuses and corruption in, in, in countries like Congo, et cetera, are not affecting me here, I'm really naive. So, so that's, that was what I wanted to, share today. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Lucas. If I could just uh, jump in. Um, yeah, if you want to ask uh, questions, please, please do so. Uh, the the, the Q&A is, is open or, or in the in the chat. If not, there's uh, lots of uh, 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 things we can discuss just amongst ourselves. Just to pick up on something that Lucas said there, if I may, um, about, you know, laws not 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 being uh, uh, implemented. Uh, I mean, certainly hit the, the nail on the head especially in the uk it, you know because it, in one sense if you if you if you look at the uk you know we're, we're ahead of the game in terms of, of of laws we're one of the first countries to introduce the beneficial ownership register uh we introduced the unexplained wealth order our um uh, evaluation by the Finan financial action task force put us you know number one in the last uh you know five ten years or so um and yet we have this seeming flood of of of, of scandals and, and and money um coming into the uk uh not much is done and that is because i think you know the the, the national crime agency is uh, budget has been has been cut and these laws simply aren't um 
aren't implemented, aren't enforced. Um, in regard, Lucas, you mentioned also about, um, you know, I think the banks, and I think this is also quite key uh, based on the research uh, you know, I have done, um, you know, the, the banks escape legal li liability by issuing countless suspicious activity reports. They could, you know, close the account and, and, and refuse service as indeed any biz business can, but they, they don't tend to do that. They just file a, a, a SAR to get themselves off the, uh, off the hook uh, and the money keeps flowing. I was just looking at the most recent suspicious activity report published by the UK authorities, came out a couple of weeks ago. We're up to uh, 900,000 uh, a year now. I think last year's figure was over was about 700,000. Uh, um, and we have a system which just cannot cope with the amount of suspicious activity reports being sent by banks. Uh, meanwhile, all the other sectors, real estate agents, lawyers, are sending very few uh, SARS. So the intelligence that the authorities are are, are, are getting is um, you know, rather limited and the information it is getting, it's not acting upon. Um, so it is, it, it is a rather troubling situation. Um, what else did I want to, to, to say? Um, on um, Chris's point about you know, how, how this uh, case was, was uh, um, discovered, um, yeah, absolutely it wasn't. It wasn't to, uh, you know, in, in regard to um, you know, law enforcement authorities doing, doing their, their, their jobs. And I think what is, I think, depressing about the Karimova story is that this is one of the most clear-cut cases we, we have ever had in terms of the evidence that we have, including the work from the US Department of Justice, which really indicates, you know, how this scheme, scheme, scheme worked. And even then, we have a situation where $300 million or whatever it may be might be flowing back to, to Karimova. Uh, and if you really look at it, Karimova's schemes were really not that uh, sophisticated. She was using her boyfriend and her, her, her friends, people that she was pictured sitting next to in her fashion shows, uh, that she was using them as, as, as proxies. Uh, you could easily come up with a with a scheme which used uh, you know more distant proxies um, using telecoms companies that weren't playing weren't paying so much over the odds uh, to make it look like a legitimate deal, uh, and then then the, it would be even harder uh, to 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 go after the money. And indeed, you know the most successful uh, kleptocracies, Kazakhstan, for example, have this element of you know making it look as 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 legitimate as as as, as possible. Um, so um, yeah, that's that's just all I wanted to say in response to um, the uh, discussions. Um, as I say, I've got maybe one thing I want to say about uh, uh, the the new register in the UK, but uh, um, I'm not sure if there are any 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 questions. Uh, Isabella, do you have anything? Not at the moment. There are just a few comments in the chat. Um... So if there are any questions that anyone has in regards to what was presented, please pop them in the Q&A or raise your hand and you can come off mute. Tom, can I come, jump in with a kind of comment and, and, a, and a, um, I think there's a question connected to it. And that is, um, you know, we're talking here about how there are significant failures in the administration of justice when it comes to kleptocracy. And we're looking at where this is taking place and it's taking place in multiple jurisdictions in various different ways. But at the same time, uh, I guess, um, you know, part of me wonders um, about, you know, for example, when you do get an incredulous reaction from law enforcement in Gibraltar, that um, firstly, um, do um, when law enforcement look at cases like this, they see years of their life flash before their eyes, um, countless appeals, and each one of those law enforcement agencies that may have a, a, a reason to take an interest in it would all have their KPIs that they have to meet. Um, they would all be looking for, and, and understandably, when you have KPIs, which are linked to your organization's success, that's li linked to your professional ascendancy, um, which everyone obviously wants. Um, do you go for really high hanging fruit that's going to be, uh, or do you go for really um, simple, straightforward cases? And 
And I guess what, you know, we know with each kleptocratic um, case that we look at is they're really in a target hardening, even less sophisticated uh, setups like this. They have the resources to keep these things strung out for years and, um, and the like. So I guess it's wondering also about, um, you know, how do we, how do we deal with the fact that these cases are difficult to prosecute? There, there are risks of, of it not being successful. And how does that chime in with cash-strapped anti-corruption agencies that have probably their own KPIs to worry about, which means that they don't really have much of an incentive institutionally to go after low-hanging fruit, much less the, the or the what we call mid-hanging fruit, much less high-hanging fruit. I mean, that's a it's a it's a question that sort of resounds for me from from looking at this you know absolutely and, and and what we're seeing is exactly that's that's what's happening uh you know we have uh, you know comments made uh, you know by the national crime agency which have been reported that you know they they, they think it's a waste of time to go after anybody who can uh, you know uh, uh, an oligarch who can afford an expensive uh, uh lawyer um, and, you know, with unexplained wealth orders, we've had this complete failure of the case against Dariga Nazarbayeva, um, but successful cases against the, the kind of local mafia guy in, in the north of, of, of England, which suggests that unexplained wealth orders going forward may be more useful uh, to, you know, targeting the, the organized criminal rather than the, the kleptocrat. You, you would hope that, you know, maybe with the, you know, the Russian invasion that, you know, the, 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 the chickens are coming home to roost a little bit and we're, we're starting to, to see that our, our, our path is, is not being the, the correct one. And with, you know, money laundering cases, uh, you know, ongoing against several of the, of, the, of the Russian oligarchs, you know, perhaps that will indicate a, uh, you know, a, a, a a, a change of some sort, but I think my, my my fear is that the change may only be in relation to to, to, to Russian illicit finance. Meanwhile, all the other stuff just just continues as, as you've pointed out. Because why, you know, would you put the head on, head on your line? You know, the person who was uh, responsible for the Dariga Nazarbayeva um, uh, unexplained wealth order was 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 hit with a one point five million pound uh, uh, bill of of to pay her costs, wiping out the entire. Uh, an explained well thought of budget, so that person probably isn't going to try the same thing again. So it, it certainly is. It certainly is an issue. Okay, um, we have Robert Rottenberg who raised his hand. Go ahead, Robert. Thank you. Um, who are her? Who were her enablers at the very beginning? How did she get her start? Uzbek, Russian. Um, what 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 are the, her um, origins other than her father, who later imprisoned her? But um, what what are her origins? And I confess an interest in this issue because she was a student at Harvard in 1998 in a class that I taught about corruption and not how to do it, but how to uh, oppose it, of course. And she sat there quietly with her first husband throughout the course. And when I uh, um, talked about uh, dictators and kleptocracy and so on, she kept very silent, couldn't have learned anything very much by remaining silent. And I wondered what happened to her afterwards, how she got her start from Harvard going home. Chris, do you, do you want to uh, take that one? You might yeah. know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, she went home um, in 2001 after her um, her marriage um, was broken up. She she got divorced from her husband, who was a uh, Uzbek American, the Maksudi family. Um, she went back to um, uh, to Tashkent, and that was where her empire really started to grow. and And she um, established footholds in beverages, in media, in um, in telecommunications. Um, and in terms of, um, you know, the, the the people she was working with or the institutions she was working with, and again, with that caveat, 
you know, we're not making allegations against those institutions. We're just stating who who she worked with. Well, I mean, firstly, I mean, it's probably worthwhile noting that she that her first um, kind of main manager who worked for her claims that he was came to work for her after her, his brother was taken hostage by Karamova um, through the, the presidential security services, which uh, he was a former financial advisor to the Maksudi family working in Dubai. He claims then after his brother was taken hostage in Uzbekistan, he came back and worked for Karamova and he became her first real fixer and organizer um, and until he fled and got refuge in the United States. Um, and and he would be he would have done a lot of the work and setting up offshore accounts for her. Um, so she went, you know, she set up offshore companies firstly in the UAE, very unwisely in her own name to begin with. Um, and 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 we actually have the that was um, and then and then she and and she set up bank accounts in, unwisely in her own name to begin with. And then obviously through an era tri trial and error, she began to work and um, and 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 um, she she. It started to set up accounts, uh, uh, offshore companies in places like Gibraltar in the names, as Tom said before, of, of employees. Um, she set up, she originally was banking through Standard Chartered Bank, um, the UK, I think through their Hong Kong office. She also had um, accounts with other banks in Latvia and, and, and also I think Citibank, but I think they may have deboarded her. Um, but she certainly wasn't deported from Standard Charter and a lot of the telecoms money went through them. But the UK um, authorities have done nothing about that case. Um, she also, I believe, had assistance from advisors in Russia. I think Renaissance Capital was one of them um, who, who worked with her. Um, and then, and then, you know, one thing that came up in the Swiss investigation, she, is, she had a very sophisticated um, family office working for her. So by the time we get into the sort of mid 2000s and the late 2000s, the Swiss authorities in their investigations found that she had a, a bunch of executives who were running a family office. So they were managing her finances, managing her assets, setting up uh, what they call, I can't remember the word, they called them dump trucks or bins or whatever, all these offshore companies. They'll burn a company, they'd set them up, they open them up, transfer money through them, close them down. Um, so there was a kind of family office structure that was, um, that, was, that was working on her behalf. And then they were contracting out and going through some of the companies that, that Tom mentioned before, when they needed to set up like a company in the Isle of Man or whatever to, to, to own a private jet. Uh, and then eventually, I believe, um, one of the, the, the Lombard Odier, the Swiss bank, stole, stole her business from, from uh, Standard Charter. Dra you know, they got, the, they got the big account and um, um, because they knew that she was, she was a, a really high value client. So there's been a whole range of, um, you know, in, international financial institutions um, and, 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 and the like have been involved with her. And, and, but it was really interesting to me that, that by the time you did get to the 2000s, she, she had what would in, in ordinary financial speak be called a, a, a family office and they kind of handled a lot of the business on her behalf. I love the idea of uh, uh, Gulnada being in a, a class about corruption, uh, maybe taking <laughs> notes of how to do it rather than to uh, how to, how to uh, uh, prevent it. Um, I, I better say before we run out of time, I, my little bit about the, the UK uh, register. So for those who don't know, uh, came into force, I think, January the 31st. It, it means now that if you own a property in the UK through an offshore company in the BVI or, or Jersey or wherever, uh, you now have to put on record who owns that, that company. And, you know, this has been hailed as a, as a, as a major, uh, you know, stride forward. Now, of course, I think all transparency is, 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 is positive. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I think this is um, a step forward, but uh, I don't think it's really going to solve the problem for the following reasons. Already Oliver Bullo has identified one loophole that was actually predates the introduction of this register. Uh, a few years ago, we, we uh, increased the tax on people who are owning properties through offshore companies. What happened was people just moved those properties from offshore companies to uh, proxy people. So we have people now on the uh, land registry who actually don't own the houses, but their name is on the on the title deed, uh, thereby avoiding the tax. And clearly they would be avoiding scrutiny if it wasn't them actually being the, the, the owner. Um, a lot of people haven't actually, uh, um, I think it's, I think it's about a third of, of the companies haven't revealed information yet. So we need, we obviously need to enforce the, the, the fines to get these people to 
um, uh, reveal the, the, the owners if they, 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 they do continue to hold property through an offshore company. But I think one, one other issue with it is that, say, in this case, you have Madumarov owning the, 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 the BVI company, owning these properties. Um, so his name would be on record as owning um, the BVI company and hence the property. But in order to, you would need to know the name of the company or the name of the or the address of the property in order to 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 see that information. Now, with this case, we did have the addresses, but if it's just you know maybe he has five other properties around the UK um, somewhere in a, in a in a register, his name will will be on. Uh, you know uh, that register, but you can't actively search and say, "Oh, who does Mr. X own any property in in the UK?" Uh, now you might say, "Well, that's 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 how it should be because of of, of, of data protection and uh, privacy." But actually, one th one interesting thing we found um, doing research for this report is that in in Spain, uh, it's not a a, a Public register, but if you have a reason to access it, uh, and journalism is 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 a legitimate reason, you can ask uh, for a small fee uh, the Spanish authorities to do a check against uh, anybody's name, and that's what what we did do. So we we, we sent in a request for Madumarov and Karimova, and it came up uh, blank. Uh, Karimova was the uh, ambassador to Spain for a time, so we thought maybe she would have property uh, there. It doesn't unfortunately uh, look at uh, historical purchases, so she may have, if she did have, own a property, she may have sold it in the, uh, uh, in, in the interim. Uh, but it's interesting that Spain, EU country, has a system where you can actually do this check against, uh, against people's names. Obviously, the UK law enforcement can, can do those checks, but the wider general public in the UK can't. And maybe that's something you know, we want to, 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 to look at opening up this register for, uh, for journalists and for legitimate uh, um, you know, public interest uh, in, in inquiries. And that would prevent this, uh, um, this uh, difficulty that I've, that I've noted that as far as I'm, I'm aware, you won't be able to search for people's names who own uh, uh, property through, through offshore companies. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's the register of uh, overseas uh, entities done. Great, Tom. Before we close, let me ask you the question that we opened the event um, promotion with, which is: um, This is a really excellent case on enablers and asset reparation. But the, what does the Karimova case also teach us um, about how civil society can gear up in the fight against cryptocracy? And would love to hear from other speakers as we have two more minutes to go. Thanks. Well, I think we just need, you know, as many eyes on this as 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 we can. When uh, you know new, new legislation is is uh, uh, you know adopted, we need it analysed um, in terms of its, uh, you know, uh, um, how 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 strong it is and whether it's being uh, enforced. Um, I think you know one good thing that's come out in the last ten years is that kleptocracy is is a bit of a buzzword now. Even people like kind of BuzzFeed are reporting uh, on it. Obviously, with you know Russia's you know uh, illegal uh, invasion, a lot more people are are, are talking about uh, you know dodgy Russian cash in, in in the UK, and those links are being I think made between uh, international organisations all all over the world to try and bring some light to this. And so maybe we can't stop it, but by reporting on it, we can go at least a little bit way in in in, in terms of uh, describing the problem. Great, and Lucas. Yes, uh, I think that's uh, that, that, that's a, the key point. I mean, it, it, the civil society can do can do uh, um, uh, reporting, can can uh, raise uh, awareness and tell uh, about uh, those these corruption stories and 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 telling the truth about behind 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 the, the, those people. But I think that that that's. The maximum, in a way, we can we can achieve uh, somehow. So I think we should put the focus on authorities or, or law enforcement uh, authorities to invest more. It's worth it. I mean, the, the more you invest, the more you, you get you, you get back. So to, to, to be honest, is not is not for me. Is definitely the a, a lack of, of maybe is a lack of of, of will. To prosecute or to investigate certain, uh, certain cases because the information is there. Civil society is continuously actually voicing uh, these issues uh, uh, around and around, and, and I think this is what we should keep doing. Uh, but there is a need for more investment to be, to, to stop feeding the beast, as I keep saying. 
if I ju jump in with one one comment as well, I mean, I think what this case raised for me um, is that maybe as uh, we, we've we're well aware of corporate secrecy structures and financial secrecy structures uh, that disconnect kleptocrats from their crime. I think one thing that we're not as aware of is political secrecy structures. And that, you know, one of the mistakes made by Karamova was she took a minor office in the foreign affairs. She didn't need to take that office. It wasn't pertinent to her political authority. She would have been very wise just to remain the daughter of the president, wield all the political authority she had from behind closed doors. And that would have disconnected her from the jurisdiction of a lot of authorities who could potentially prosecute her otherwise. And we're seeing a lot of very smart operators is in place like Uzbekistan who have political authority, but do not take public office and are able to organize their business um, and organize their affairs and organize their corruption without ever, whilst being disconnected from the crime. And I think as civil society, we need to draw attention as, much, as well to these systems of political secrecy to show how people don't need to have public office in order to wield public power and to explain the structures through it, which that takes place so that these people do not get to enjoy impunity because they found a new loophole. And I'll just go to Leila to close off and loop back with Tom. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I'll keep this short. Um, I just wanted to also mention that probably for us, the civil society, it's also important to advocate with the uh, democratic countries to, um, to, to let them know that it's very important to take action before a kleptocracy starts a war, for example, that... Um, that there are people out there that need to be investigated, that need to be looked into, who are quite threatening both to their own nations and to the Western world as well. So um, this advocacy is, um, is something that, that I think we, we need to pay more attention to in the coming, uh, in the coming months. Thank you. Thank you, Leila. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Chris. And um, Thank you everyone who joined and um, Lucas, of course, as well. Thank you for being our discussant. Um, I will hand it to Tom to just say a final word and we really appreciate you joining today. Well, thanks everyone. And thanks uh, to Global Integrity and uh, Isabella, especially for, for organizing the event. Um, you know, hopefully you can uh, make it through to the end of the report. It's, I wanted it to be 20 pages. It ended up being about, about 70. Um, so there's a lot to di digest there. Um, we're of course all available to answer questions if you're interested in this topic um, further. But um, yeah, I guess on to the on to the next investigation. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank Tom. You. Thanks, Sayers. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you very much.